Hey there, welcome back. It's been a while. Today we're going to talk about value objects. Value objects are fairly common in software engineering, especially domain-driven design. Even though we talk a lot about it, people often have the impression that it is a hard concept or that it is an advanced technique, and it is not. It's actually quite simple. On this video, I'm going to show you what a value object is and how you can use it in your applications. However, before we even talk about value objects, let's take a look at a situation I created here. Obviously, this is all fake code. It doesn't really work, but uh, we're going to use it as an example. So we have this fridge software. It controls a fridge's temperature. So we're fetching all the fridges that we have. As you can see, this is a fairly simple implementation. We're just returning, obviously, this fake data as well. We're not actually hitting the database. So we're returning some fridges. We are picking one of the fridges, and then we are setting its temperature to 20. 20 watt, I don't know, Celsius, let's say. And if I run the script, you can see that it says that the fridge temperature is 20. If you have watched Silicon Valley, you might remember when Jin Yang bought a smart fridge and Guilfoyle hacked it. You attack and destroy my refrigerator? And you misspell my name. I did. I had to overclock Anton, but I was able to brute force the backdoor password to that chrome piece of shit in under 12 hours. But I added a little visual flair. So you could set the temperature remotely. Imagine this is one of those smart fridges. Now, this is a problem we see in most softwares. Sure, this is a simplified example, so you might not see the problem here. But if you think a little bit, I'm sure you're going to remember some situation on a software that you worked on that had this problem. First, we don't know what temperature means. Is it Celsius? Is it Fahrenheit? I don't know. And secondly, the types are not great here. So the first thing is, if you look at the signature, we're just accepting a temperature. It doesn't really matter what it is. So I could actually pass, you know, a string here. And if we run this, it works. Obviously, it shouldn't because you, you can have an ABCD temperature. It must be a number. So the first thing that we can do in those situations is type hint this. So we can say that I expect a float here or an, an integer, but let, let's go with float. Now, if I run this, it is going to explode. We're passing a string, we're expecting a float. Now we can go here and we can also update this to a float. So we have type safety here. We're expecting a float. We cannot receive a string. It just won't work. Okay, cool. So now we know that we expect a float here or an integer and PHP is going to coerce it to, to a float. If we run this, it works again. Now, the problem is I can pass something like this. So can you have a temperature minus 3000? No, you can't. Not in Fahrenheit, not in Celsius, not in Kelvin. That temperature does not exist. So even though our signature is valid, we are expecting a number. We are getting a number. The truth is we are not really expecting a number. We are expecting a temperature. So before we even go to talk about the definition of a value object, I want to say that an object, a value object represents a concept in your domain. In a business context, it represents something. It, it, it isn't just a value. It represents the value in the context that you're working on. So in this case, we're talking about fridges and we have the software that manages fridges. So we're not talking about a float. We're talking about a temperature, which happens to be a float. So we are encapsulating a float, but it's not any float. If you're talking Celsius, and if you've watched Senseiya, you might remember that Aquarius came as a um, signature move, which frees the opponent to minus 273 degrees Celsius. So that's the lowest temperature you could go on with Celsius. If we're talking Fahrenheit, I have no clue. If we're talking Kelvin, it's zero Kelvin. So we're not supposed to accept anything here. We're supposed to accept a valid temperature. And that's kind of what a value object is. When we talk about value objects, we're talking about an object that is immutable, so we cannot change its value. It has no identity. What does that even mean? So for example, on our fridge, you can see that if we go to the fridge object, we have an ID. That's the identifier for the fridge. It is unique. We know that it points to a certain fridge and that's it. It is identifiable. A value object has no identity. It has a value and that's what we're going to use as its identity. So if you're comparing two value objects and they they have different memory spaces, but they have the same value, they have the same value, they are the same. And finally, it represents a context in your domain. I'm sorry, not a context, but uh, a concept. So that's a value object, immutable, no identity, and it encapsulates a value and it represents something 
in your domain. So the first thing that we could do here is I am going to go to source. I'm going to create a new class called temperature. Cool. So we just want to accept a value, which is a float, right? So like this, and that's it. So if we go back to index, we can narrow our types a little bit. So see, we went from the types to floats, which is good, but it's not enough. Now we're going from float to temperature. What you want here is not a float, it is a temperature. And that's what we're going to pass. We're also going to update this. There we go. So first we have to update this because as you can see, it is already failing. We need to pass a temperature. Okay, cool. We have much narrower types now. I'm going to reinforce this. A value object represents a concept. In this case, what our method expects is not a float, it is a temperature. And we're going to encapsulate the float inside the value object. Okay, cool. So let's go back here. As you can see, PHP Storm is already complaining about this. Let's try passing this. It doesn't work because we don't expect float, we expect a temperature. So let's encapsulate this in a temperature class. There we go. Okay. Let's try now. Okay, it could not be converted to string because it is an object. So for now, let's do this. Okay, cool. So it is working. We're expecting the temperature, but it doesn't really change a lot. Sure, it gives us uh, more context. We know that we're talking about a temperature, but it doesn't really change a lot. So what we can do now is implement some business rules within that value object. I want to reinforce that value objects should not be generic. As I said, they represent a concept within your domain. So you shouldn't have, unless it just applies to everything in your host software, a global temperature value object. If you're talking about freezers, you have a certain temperature value object. If you're talking about a freezer or something that you would use uh, industrially or something like that, then you probably want a different temperature value object. They have to be scoped. Otherwise, they, they kind of lose their meaning, really. So what we can say here is if the temperature is lesser than 273, which is absolute zero in Celsius, we want to throw an exception. And we can throw a invalid argument exception, say a temperature can cannot be lower than Celsius. And I do not know how to write. So there we go. Jesus. Okay, there we go. So let's run this now. And it exploded. So now we have a clear indication of what we expect. It isn't a float. It is a temperature, and this temperature has its own business rules. Now, since we're talking about a fridge, and surely a fridge will not go to minus 273 degrees, then this doesn't make a lot of sense. What we probably want is, what is the lowest temperature a fridge can go? Um, maybe the lowest temperature for the fridges we support is minus 20 and we can implement that. So if it is less than 20, we want to, to explode. We want to make this fail. And the reason this is so important is because, again, you probably went through this at some point. You have a method or you have an object, doesn't really matter, and you've passed a value that it is, it, it is accepted by the code. It works, it runs, but it is invalid. So for example, we could have passed minus 3000 degrees, and it would have worked. So imagine this was actually communicating to a fridge, my fridge, for example, or your fridge. The code would work, but it would fail. If we were to be lucky, something at some point would fail. Maybe when communicating to the fridge, it would throw an error. We would catch this error and the code would fail at some point. Maybe we could wrap this in uh, a transaction and then we wouldn't have a lot of trouble. The entire thing would fail, the database would not be affected, and we would communicate the user that the temperature they said was invalid, or if it was something internal to our system, we would see an error log, something like that. However, what often happens is the code silently fails. So maybe if we were to pass such a low temperature to the fridge, it wouldn't do anything. Maybe you would set to the highest temperature possible. I don't know, it would be unexpected. And that's what you get with invalid state. In this case, a temperature of even lower, let's say of minus 60 Celsius is invalid. The fridge is not supported. Our code base, our software uh, was built on the fact that it shouldn't be allowed. So you do not want to pass invalid state around. You probably have dealt with this more than once and 
it is not fun at all, especially when it's silent and fails, or rather when it doesn't fail and you're just passing valid state, that's going to fail at some point um, because you don't you don't have an error. So you don't know something went wrong. OK, so um, we apply this business rule. So if we were to run this, it is going to fail. Uh, we have to update this to minus 20. OK, cool. We get a proper error message. Now, we probably should not be able to pass something very hot as well. So 50 degrees your food is not going to be well after that. So if you were to pass this, it should fail, it doesn't. So what we can do is we can say if the temperature is lower than minus 20, or if it is hotter than let's say 40, it should fail. And then we can say that the temperature should be, should be between minus 20 and 40 Celsius. So if you run this, it fails again. And now what we've done is with narrower types further than what the native types allowed. So we previously had a float. Now we have an actual temperature and we've given context to the code. We know that we're talking about a temperature. We know that we're talking about a temperature in the context of a fridge of what our software does within that domain. And now we have a value object that allows us to validate those business rules. So if we were to try and write some code, it doesn't really matter if it's user input, if it's something calculated within the app, the code would fail at this point. It would not go further than this. It would fail upon the object's creation. And that's pretty much it. There, there's nothing you know inherently complicated about value objects. It is fairly simple. It's just an object. We're just encapsulating a value and applying our business rules to not only gives us domain specificity, but also to give us context. So now we have a temperature. It works just as well. You might have noticed that we ran into a problem. We were trying to turn this into a string. It wouldn't work. What you can do in those cases is you can implement a two string method. This is a magic method from PHP. And you can say, if you're trying to cast this into a string, you can just return the temperature. Oops, I have to fix the temperature in my back. Let's say 10 degrees. That's reasonable. I think it's in our repository. Oh, OK, it's right here. So now it is working. We don't have to call the actual property. We can use the two string method. Another thing that I mentioned was it features equality by value. And what I mean with this is let's say let's get rid of this. Let's create two temperatures. So uh, temperature, we're going to go with 10 and then another temperature. We're also going to go with 10. If we were to compare this and say temperature equals another temperature, this is going to fail because we're talking about objects and they reference different memory spaces. So they're not the same. As I said, in value objects, we focus on the value and it's also super simple to implement. We can just create, let's say, an equals method, which also expects a temperature like this and returns a boolean. And we can just say that this temperatures temperature should be equal to our internal temperature. That's pretty much it. We're comparing the values. And if we run this, obviously we haven't changed this, so it wouldn't work. We can say the temperature equals, so whether it is equal to another one. And if we run this, it is. Now, if we were to change this to another value, now it isn't. Um, obviously, I forgot about this but you want this to be immutable. If you're running PHP 8.2, you can use the read only property on a class. So if we try to manipulate the temperature to something else, like let's say 30, it is going to fail because it is read only. If you're not in PHP 8.2, but you are on 8.1, you can pass read only to the property. And it's going to behave the same, but it's not global. It's not for the entire class. Now, if you're working with immutable classes such as value objects, data transfer objects, you can just apply this here. And now the entire class is only readable. You cannot manipulate it. And that's pretty much it. A common example with value objects as well is money. Money is tough to deal with. If you've ever worked with monetary values, it isn't easy at all. The reason I didn't use that as an example was because it goes a bit further than a simple value object. And you have really good libraries in the PHP community that do that, but they're all based on value objects. So instead of having, uh, let's say you have, I don't know, a subscription and you have a price instead of it returning something like that, you return, let's say, a money object with a value, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the kind of thing that you would use a value object for addresses as well. If you want to aggregate them within an object, it's also helpful. As you can see, value objects are 
helpful in many situations. And I hope this video helped you somehow. I'm sure that if you if you previously didn't know about value objects, I'm sure that you're going to start seeing its usage now. You're going to be working and you're going to say, mm, I think this should be a value object or maybe the value object would help me here. That's pretty much all I have to say about value objects on this lesson. I hope you guys were able to learn something and I see you in the next video. Bye bye.